you would please stand. Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him. Chosen seed of Israel's race, he ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord. tribe on this terrestrial ball. To him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. To him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. name let angels prostrate fall bring forth the royal diadem and crown him lord of all bring forth the royal diadem and crown him lord treasure of my longing soul. My God, like you, there is no other. True delight is found in you alone. Your grace so well to deep to fathom. Your love exceeds the heavens' reach. Your truth, the fount of perfect wisdom, my highest good and my unending Oh, Lord, my rock and my redeemer, strong defender of my weary heart, my sword to fight the cruel deceiver, and my shield against his hateful darts. My song when enemies surround me, 
my hope when tides of sorrow rise, my joy when trials are abounding, your faithfulness, my refuge in the Savior of my ruined life, my guilt and cross laid on your shoulders, in my place you suffered, bled, and died. You rose the grave and death are conquered. last time. <laughs> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a
seated. Oh, will you bow your heads with me? Father, we come before you. We're so excited just to be able to be here to praise our Savior all day long. And you are our story, our song. You are everything. And we're just so thankful we have the opportunity to gather corporately, to open your word, to learn just the deeper truths of who you are, your love for us, to be, have a greater understanding of who we are apart from you and just makes it that much more sweet. The sweeter it is, Lord, uh, just knowing just what you have done through the cross. And I just pray this morning you will be glorified in all that we uh, look at and, and take in. And, and again, that we will worship you in, in a greater way, Lord. Thank you so much for this time. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bible, please turn with me. We are now in the 11th chapter, almost there. Chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 15 this morning. If I can get there. Chapter 11. How many of you, when you were a kid, you used to tell, uh, say this to your friends or you go back and forth with it? Sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Well, that's kind of true and kind of not true, Right? Names can hurt. Names actually can hurt quite a bit. And the fact of the matter is, no one likes being called names. And I think one of the worst names that someone can be called would likely be the name traitor. Nobody wants to be known as a traitor. And for good reason. Because to have that name associated with you, it likely means that you have betrayed someone on a very deep level, maybe a family member, maybe a friend. Now, I remember when I was going through school in the military and we studied in inside of this giant vault because of the material that we were looking at. It was uh, highly confidential, so we had to enter into this vault. It was like behind four gates just to get into this vault. But I remember as we would walk into the vault, there on the side walls were all of these different posters, and they would line all these, these walls with just posters just as a reminder of what we were getting ourselves into and what was at stake. And some of them said, like, loose lips sink ships, you know, or an enemy ear may be near. And the whole premise of it was you need to be aware of your surroundings, and you need to make sure you hold confidentiality to everything that you are learning. You need to hold it tight, hold it close. Reason being, because if it was leaked to our adversaries, it had the possibility of causing serious or grave damage to our national security. It could put sailors and Marines and airmen, we could put people's lives at risk. But as we entered this vault, there was one big picture which you could not get away from. And in his name was John Walker. Some of you may have heard that name before. Notorious in the Navy, for sure. He was part of the Navy, but when he uh, exited the Navy, he still stayed as a contractor, and he was privy to a lot of just sensitive information. Now, John Walker, he worked, again, as that contractor, but what he was doing during that time, working for the Navy... He was taking these very sensitive secrets, and he was selling them to the KGB in the Soviet Union. 
And he got his entire family involved in this, and they were making pretty good money. So they were taking all these secrets about our submarines, the, um, the gear ratios, the different aspects of our submarines, the frequencies that they put off, all this different highly uh, important information, and he was selling all of this to the Soviets. Well, needless to say, it didn't work out very well for him because he eventually did get caught, but not after doing very grave damage. And that was something that was always in the front of our mind. We do not want to be this guy. We do not want to be known as a traitor to our country because there's serious consequences for it. Now, we're given several examples of traitors within Scripture as well. Matter of fact, if you think of David's son Absalom, after he was a little bit older and he uh, decided that he wanted to be king and he tried to usurp his father's authority by pushing him out and taking over, and we know that that didn't work out very well for Absalom, to say the least. We also see in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul, as he is sitting on death row, and he is just kind of looking back on his life and the people who were in his life and people who had turned on him. And one of those people in specific was that of Demas, and we are told that Demas did him much harm. Demas basically turned on him, was close to him, and just stabbed him in the back. Paul saw him as a traitor. But if we were to look in Scripture, where would, who would be the ultimate traitor? If we, were to, if we were to really focus in, Judas, without doubt, willing to betray the Lord of glory for a meager 30 pieces of silver. And most people associate Judas as the greatest traitor because how many kids do parents name Judas? Not many. I've never come across, I've come across Jude, but I've never heard someone say, oh, this is my beloved son, Judas. It just does not happen, and for good reason. No one wants to be associated with the term traitor. No one. But in direct contrast, one of the most beautiful words that can be ascribed to someone, some of the most treasured words in any vocabulary are the words loyalty, faithfulness, devotion. I don't know about you, that's what I want to be known by. Those are nice words. Those are great words. And the Word of God places a high value on the importance of loyalty. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to be loyal to one another. We are, to, we are called to lift each other up, to bear one another's burdens, to have compassion on one another, to be kind. But our ultimate loyalty, where does that belong? It's Christ, Jesus Christ. Just as we are commanded within Scripture, we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, our soul, and strength. But the Bible also makes it very clear that having such devotion to God, it does not come easy, and it's not cheap. The Lord Jesus Christ, he made this very clear when he walked the earth. He described the price of allegiance, loyalty to him, and what it would cost. Listen to what he says in Matthew chapter 10. He says, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. You see, when we speak of loyalty... Regarding our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ, it can be costly, very costly. It may result in fracturing families, the loss of friendships. It may even cost us our lives, and we know this because if you go and you look overseas right now, this is being played out every single day. People are being martyred for their faith, for holding strong to their love of Christ. 
And the Bible, it strongly emphasizes the need for loyalty. James would warn his readers that those who are not completely loyal to God should not expect anything from him. And the seven churches that John wrote to, the seven churches of Asia Minor that we find in Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, we're told that five of those seven churches were personal, re personally rebuked by the Lord Jesus Christ himself because they were not loyal. But one thing for certain, none of the New Testament writers were more concerned about the loyalty and devotion to the church than that of the Apostle Paul. And there was no church that he was more concerned about than the church of Corinth. Now, as we've seen throughout this letter, the Corinthian church, it had openly rebelled against Paul's authority. They had basically turned their back on him. They've allowed these false teachers to infiltrate the assembly. They've twisted the words of God. They've followed now a counterfeit gospel. And these false teachers, they were able to deceive through the manipulating words that they spoke, the flattering words that they spoke. They were able to deceive the people into believing that Paul was not a man who should be trusted. And they led many astray with their seductive lies, their deceptions. They got a good portion of the church to go after strange doctrines. A good portion to believe that Paul was a charlatan. Simply put, the church was filled with traitors. A lot of them. But here's the thing. Paul never gave up on them. Never. After sending a severe letter to them, the majority of the church of Corinth did in fact repent. They did come to their senses. They started getting their act together and and coming back to Paul's words to the true gospel. But the false teachers were still there. Yeah, they were put back on their heels. They kind of hid in the shadows, but they had not gone anywhere. They were just abiding their time. They were waiting for the next time to strike, waiting for the opportunity to create chaos and disorder. So Paul closes his letter with an outright assault on these false teachers. And that's exactly what we have here in chapters 10 through 13. Paul's going after them, and he's hammering them. He's calling them out of the darkness into the light so they can be exposed for what they are. You see, Paul had a passion for Christ and Christ alone, but he knew that if he did not defend himself, if he did not defend the gospel, this church was not going to last. It was going to crumble from the inside. So reluctantly, he compares himself to these so-called super apostles so that the Corinthians can clearly distinguish between the true and the false. He pits himself against them. And that's essentially what we see here in chapter 11, chapters 10 and 11 for that matter. And in doing so, he gives us a wonderful example of how we are to keep the church and ourselves pure from deceivers. How we could be loyal and walk blameless before our great God. Even in a chaotic and deceptive age. Now, I titled this morning's message, Staying Devoted in the Days of Deception. Because I think that all that Paul had to deal with here in the Corinthian church, we are not immune. As a matter of fact, I think that the days are just as dark or even darker today than, than they were when he wrote this letter. The problems and the false doctrines that he faced are no different than we face today. And I would even argue that we have more deception, more dishonesty than ever before. So in the passage before us, he's going to lay out four wonderful principles, four wonderful truths to help us remain devoted and faithful to our great God as we live in this broken world, this deceptive age. And with that introduction, let's go ahead and we'll jump into our passage and we'll just start breaking this down verse by verse, verse 1 all the way through 15, amen? Paul writes, verse 1, I wish you bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you 
to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Now, Paul, he begins this letter with a little bit of irony, actually a lot of irony. He speaks to them, and he's like, I just ask you, please, just to bear with me, just a little bit of foolishness that I want to speak. Please listen to me. He's asking the Corinthians to put up with him. But I ask you, who are really the foolish ones here? Who were the ones who were guilty of dismissing the truth of Scripture, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then going off into following lies? Listen, it wasn't Paul. He wasn't the fool. Who was the fool in this scenario, in this situation? It was them. And though there is definitely a hint of sarcasm in his words right here, you need to take a step back and realize Paul's heart is broken. He's hurting that they would so quickly abandon the truth, that they would so quickly turn on him. He's being cynical, yes. But in the same way, he doesn't shout at them. He doesn't try to lord it over, him, over them with his words. Rather, he comes to them with a spirit of hum humility. He comes to them with gentleness, with brokenness. But this is also important to see. He doesn't turn a blind eye. He does confront. He comes to them and say, okay, it's time that we need to deal with this issue. We need to deal with all that's going on in this church. And he gives us a beautiful example as to how we as Christians are to address those who have wronged us. Beloved, we are to confront. When we know something is not right, we have the obligation, we have the duty to lovingly, to kindly go to that person and to try to make things right. Just as we're told in Proverbs 15, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. We need to be willing to lovingly go to people who hurt us and to be able to have that conversation, to make things right. You see, Paul could have went to this church and just said, okay, you're a problem, you're a problem, you're a problem, excommunicated, excommunicated, excommunicated. But he didn't do that. He loved them. Instead of excommunication, he, what did he seek? Restoration. He wanted them to be restored. He wanted the entire church to come to its senses. He wanted everyone to be walking in the truth. So he makes this plea to them. Look at verse 2. He says, For I have a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to the one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Now understand, Paul's jealousy right here isn't for himself. It's not because necessarily they turned against him. His jealousy was because they turned against their true love, their first love, that being the Lord Jesus Christ. And yeah, that created a jealousy in him because he wanted this church to walk closely with the Lord. He wanted them to have an intimate communion, a daily walk with them. And that made him jealous because now they were following another. They were being seduced into believing lies. And he expressed concern over their disloyalty to Christ by using an analogy right here that they would have easily understood, as we can easily understand, that being the marriage covenant. Now, as we look at this, we need to understand there were multiple elements in the first century Judaism, in the Jewish culture, of a marriage ceremony or, or marriage in general. But like ours, there were basically two major aspects of it. There were the engagement or the betrothal, and then you had the actual wedding ceremony itself. And the betrothal, it was set up by the parents, by the bride and the groom. Sometime, sometimes the betrothal, this agreement between the father of the bride and the father of the groom was set up when the children were still just little youngins. They weren't even old enough to know who they were yet. But in most cases, they were getting close to being teenagers. But the fathers would come together. A dowry would be paid, the price of the bride from the father of the groom. And this young couple would then stand in front of each other, and then they would say their vows in the presence of their family. At the end of the short ceremony, the couple, they were betrothed which means that they were legally, they were legally bound as husband and wife. 
Now, this betrothal period normally lasted up to about a year, and this gave, it gave the new groom ample time to be able to go back and set up a new home for his bride, to be able to get everything in order, his finances in order, his house in order, to get everything done that needed to be done in order to raise a family. But during this time as well, they were husband and wife, but this marriage could not be consummated. They had to stay pure. They needed to remain pure, devoted to one another. It was a time for them to grow in their love for each other, to get to know each other on a deeper, on a more intimate, personal level as they look forward to their new life together. But the father of the bride also had a very important responsibility. The father of the bride, he was to watch over his daughter. He was there to ensure her purity. He was to watch over to her to make sure that she stayed devoted to her new husband until that day of consummation would come, possibly a year later. He was to ensure that his daughter remained pure and faithful to her pledged husband. Again, so that when the day of the wedding supper came, she could be presented to him without spot or blemish. You see, Paul saw himself as the spiritual father of the Corinthians. It was through his preaching that they heard the gospel. It was through his preaching that they believed and received salvation. It was through his teaching that they had been betrothed to their husband, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he saw it as his duty to keep the church pure and devoted to the Lord. To love him, to serve him as their greatest treasure. You see, Paul wanted to ensure that they remained faithful to Jesus all the way to the end. Until the Lord Jesus Christ returned for them or until death do them part. But either way, he wanted to make sure that that church remained pure. He was their father, their spiritual father. And this is why his heart is so burdened right here. Because he's concerned that this church had become unfaithful. Now, I want you to put yourself in this situation. Imagine being a parent of a young girl. She's deeply in love with her fiancé. She's excited, she's excited for the fact that very soon they are gonna be, they're going to be married and enjoy this incredible life together. But then as the months go by, you as the father, you see the relationship start to deteriorate. It starts to unravel at the seams. She begins to distance herself from her fiancé. And you find out that she's been tempted by the seducing words of a more outwardly attractive man. He has money. Oh, he's got a lot of charisma, a lot of charm. But you know that this man who is seducing her is godless to the core. Now, being on the outside, you know that all he desires from your daughter is to use her to abuse her, to leave her broken and empty. Now, if this were your daughter, how would you respond to that situation? Would you fight for her? Would you love her enough to tell her the truth about who this man really is who's trying to infiltrate into her life? I think no doubt we all would. You see, that's the picture that Paul's painting for us right here in this passage. You see, these false teachers, they're enticing many to leave their first love, to go after a very wicked, godly counterfeit. And he cries out to them, please reconsider what you are about to do. Stay devoted to your first love. Don't commit spiritual adultery. Don't be deceived by the enemy's lies. Simply put, wake up. And to drill this point home, he takes them back to the beginning, to the Garden of Eden, to show them the root of this deception. Look at verse 3. 
He says, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Now, Paul is giving them a history lesson right here. And he's showing us how easily we can, in fact, be seduced by the lies of the enemy. And he reminds them that Eve didn't just simply wake up one day and say, you know what, today I feel like cheating on God. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to go against him. I'm going to turn against him. I am going to follow the enemy. This feels like a great day to plunge the entire world into darkness. Let's do it. Do you think she woke up and said that? Absolutely not. Listen, Eve had good intentions, very good intentions. But as the saying goes, the road to hell is paved with what? Good intentions. Listen, Eve knew of God's love. She knew the truth. But she allowed herself to be enticed and deceived by half-truths. She let down her guard. She unwittingly started taking counsel from the enemy. Satan slowly started whispering in her ear, did God really say that you're not to eat from the tree of knowledge and good and evil? Eve, God knows that if you eat of it, you'll be just like him. Eve, you won't die. Come on, that's ridiculous. Listen, how did the devil get Eve to rebel against God? by undercutting the trustworthiness of God's message. The message that they received directly from the Lord. Satan promised her things that he had no power to deliver. You see, this is how Satan works in our lives. He slips in. He appears harmless. He comes in, as we will see in a few verses down, as an angel of light. What he, what he brings to us feels good. It feels right. He whispers softly into the ears a message that is enticing and attractive. Did God really say? Just like a married woman being seduced and led astray by another man, Satan slowly works to pull us away from our true husband, the Lord Jesus Christ. And once that personal intimacy is diminished in their separation, once we buy into his lies and his deceit, he moves in for the kill. He gets us to commit spiritual adultery with another. How do we keep from being enticed? Well, I ask you, how much time do you spend with your first love? How fortified is your relationship with Jesus? You see, to to stay loyal in the days of deception, I must have a discerning heart. I must have a discerning heart. I need to be aware of Satan's schemes. I need to be fully cognizant of the fact that he wants to destroy me. Now, I've been extremely blessed to be married to Sarah for 22 years. 22 wonderful years. And I could say that every year, every day gets stronger and better. It's a wonderful thing. And I'm extremely thankful for what the Lord has given me. I love the time that we spend together on the couch praying with one another. I look forward to going to the office in the morning and knowing when I get home, she is there and we're just going to have a great conversation. Just again, just really enjoying that close fellowship, just being with her every evening. I love sitting at the table and eating dinner with her and having the opportunity to share all about my life, her life, to catch up with just everything that is going on together. And then after dinner, we normally go on a nice walk, holding hands and just enjoying just the beauty of everything that is outside. And again, just enjoying one another. You see, I know my wife intimately because I spend quality time with her. 
Our relationship is strong because there is no place I would rather be than with her. On a physical level, Sarah's my best friend. She's a lover of my soul. But I ask you, how would our relationship be if there was no personal intimacy? What if I came home every day and she tried to talk to me, but I just ignored her? She's in the kitchen, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go in the living room, and I'm not going to come out, and she could do her thing, and I'm going to do my thing, and that's just how we're going to live our lives. We might just acknowledge each other in passing. What would happen to a relationship like that? Would it be fortified? No. It would be starving. We would drift apart. We would not know each other. We would open ourselves up to being seduced by another who would give us the attention that we desire. Again, no one wakes up, just naturally wakes up and says, you know what, today I want to cheat on my spouse. No one does that. It's a slow fade. It's a slow fade. And make no mistake, the same holds true on a spiritual level. Beloved, I ask you, do you remember the day that the Lord Jesus Christ saved you? the joy that filled your heart. The day when you heard the gospel, you understood that you were a sinner, that you were on death row, that there was nothing you could do to save yourself, and you just sat there knowing, Lord, I'm broken, I'm helpless, please save me. And you heard the gospel of your salvation, and you trusted your life to Christ. And you finally understood his infinite love and mercy that he had by sending his son to save you. To pay your sin debt in full by dying on the cross in your place. Do you remember that day? Do you remember the day when you trusted him and your sins were forgiven and you were washed by the perfect blood of the lamb? You were made into a new creation and you could just shout out, Hallelujah! God is good. Do you remember the joy knowing that you were the bride of Jesus Christ? And every day you look forward to opening your Bible and spending time to get to know him. And there was that freshness and there was that beauty and there was that closeness in your walk with him. Do you remember that day? The word was alive. It was fresh in your heart. Maybe it's been over time, that excitement and joy of your salvation, it has slowly started to fade. And your time with him and the word has become less and less. And without even knowing it, you have drifted apart. You see, this is how the enemy works in our lives. Once we stop spending time with the Lord Jesus Christ, once we stop praying to him and giving him our full devotion, once we stop getting with him in the word and allowing him to speak to us and to grow us and just to to love on us through truth, we become susceptible to the enemy's lies. And understand, we can be seduced, and many people are, in fact, given over to the enemy. And Paul, he gives a strong letter or a strong warning to Timothy about this in his letter. Listen to what he says. He says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting, there's that word, devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teachings of what? Demons. The teachings of demons. Listen, how do we keep from being seduced by the enemy? We must stay close to the one we love. Our eyes need to be fixed on things above, not on things of this world. We need to be completely focused in, zeroed in on what is true and what is right. We need to fill our minds with scripture. We need to have prayers constantly on our heart flowing from our lips, just as we're told in Ephesians 5.19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. 
day in, day out, constantly enjoying that close communion, fellowship with our God. You see, to stay loyal in the days of deception, I must have a sincere devotion to Christ. A sincere devotion to Christ. He must be the true love of my life. Again, I don't think that any Christian wakes up just one morning and says, you know what, today I feel like committing spiritual adultery against my Savior. No Christian does that. It's ridiculous. I want to close my eyes to truth and believe the eyes of the enemy. No one does that. But we need to understand that our heart is a vacuum. And whatever is missing will be filled with something else. Amen? If you are not filling it with Jesus, something else is going to fill your heart, and it's not going to be what is right and what is good and pure. Something will take its, pla take its place. And this is exactly what happened to the church of Corinth. They had drifted so, apart, so far apart from the Lord that that vacuum, something else, these false teachers were able to come in, and through their false doctrine, it was taking the place of truth. You see, the deceivers knew the soft spot in the church, and they offered the people an attractive alternative to the real Jesus. And Paul warns them. He says, don't fall for it. Don't believe what they're selling you. It's bunk. It's not true. Look at verse 4. He says, for if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. You fall for it. You're just going hook, line, and sinker right down the path of destruction without even thinking about it. Listen, these false teachers came in walking through the front doors of the church, teaching doctrines of demons, and they put up with it. Why? Because they were so far disconnected at this point. Paul says that they taught another Jesus, a false Christ. Now, again, we don't know specifically what they are teaching because it is never specified in this letter, but we do know it was made up of some Jewish legalism, some pagan mysticism. It was a health, wealth, prosperity gospel. It was a smorgasbord of all these different teachings that were convoluted into whatever gospel they had made. But again, they liked it. It went with their culture. It went with their mindset. It was easy to follow, and they went right down the path. And we know for a fact that it was not salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. That was not the message that was getting preached by these false apostles. Rather, it was a Jesus that promised earthly riches and pleasures. It was a false gospel that had no saving power whatsoever. And the church, again, it readily accepted it. Now, not only did those who were true Christians not try to stop those who were spreading this false gospel, but they let them get up to the pulpit and preach it. Listen, they had absolutely no spiritual discernment. And the Apostle Paul, I'm sorry, the Apostle John, he gives a strong warning concerning this in his first letter. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. He says, check yourself. Make sure that your life is lining up with this. Make sure what's coming from your pulpit is coming from this and not just from some man and the doctrines that he has made up in his head. Listen, what do we test everything against? Scripture. Everything. And if it doesn't add up, what do we do to those teachings? We throw them out. Bye. I don't need them in my life. I don't want them in my life. Paul would echo John's sentiment in his letter to the Thessalonians. He would write, do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. In other words, when people come to you and they bring teaching, don't disregard it, but test everything. Test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Throw out, abstain from every form of evil. Get rid of it. Get it out of your life. Listen, how do we know what is true and what is false? We must hold it up to the divine standard. It must add up to Scripture. That's all that matters. Sola Scriptura. All truth claims need to be vetted through the Bible. 
And we need, beloved, to be discerning. We need to be a discerning people because every day you and I are being fed propaganda. Every single day we're continually being told what to think, how to think, how to respond in certain situations. You may not even realize it's happening, but you are being conformed by the world every single day. And sadly, many are carried off by the seductive spirits. You see, to stay loyal in the days of deception, I must have a firm grasp, a firm grip on truth. You see, these false teachers had so twisted the word of God to such a degree that the Jesus that they preached no longer resembled the Jesus of the Bible. And again, sadly, the Corinthians, they tolerated it. They went right along with it. And it broke Paul's heart. Look at verse 5. Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way we have made this plain to you in all things. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge? Listen, Paul loved this church as his own spiritual children, yet they betrayed him. They followed a group of liars. And what's amazing is these super apostles, as he, as he calls them, again, a little cynicism right there, they were charging people to come and to listen to them. And for good reason, for that matter, because if you were a pro- professional speaker, people would spend top dollar to come and sit at your feet and to learn from you. Much like our day, as a matter of fact, there's a lot of gullible people out there who will spend moolah, a lot of money, to go and to sit and listen to people speak and to fill their heads, most of the time with stuff that isn't worth a hill of beans. Matter of fact, it made me think about it this week. I'm like, okay, who are the top paid speakers in our day? I was just curious, so, and I looked up the top three, and of the top, two of the top three, Behold, it really didn't surprise me. The first one, Barack Obama. Good old Barack Obama. You know how much he charges for a speaking engagement? His speaking engagement fee goes from $200,000 to $400,000 per event for people to learn absolutely nothing. $200,000 to $400,000 to sit there and have your mind turned to mush. You know who uh, came in right behind him? I bet you would never guess. $200,000 to hear her speak. I would pay $200,000 to run away as fast as I could. Is that not insane? Again, but you got to understand, the Jewish col- or the Greek culture, it was no different than our culture. People equated status with knowledge. And if you had status and knowledge, then you should be paying big price to receive that knowledge. A lot of money. Matter of fact, according to the world and according to Greek culture, the more you knew, the more you're worth. So in the Greek culture, again, where Paul was ministering, if you were a charismatic speaker who claimed to have a plethora of knowledge, the more you were worth. So for a speaker not to charge the people for his services, for a speaker to come in and say, you know what, it is free of charge, what did that insinuate about that person? He's an amateur. He's worthless. He's got nothing good to say because if he did have something good to say, what what would he be doing? He'd be charging money for it. And they use this mindset, they use this line of thinking against Paul. To say, why are you following this man? He's not charging you anything. Therefore, all that he is spewing to you is nothing. Don't listen to him. Not only that, his speaking is so bad that he's incapable of getting anyone to pay for him, even if you wanted to. But though Paul, you had to understand, though he didn't have refined oratory skills like these so-called super apostles who charge exorbitant fees, 
he proved himself by his integrity, by his loyalty, his love and dedication to the church. He showed without a doubt who he really was. He showed them the heart of Jesus by walking before them in kindness and humility. He was even willing to go without food, without shelter. He made tents on the side to cover any cost that he couldn't get if he didn't have money. He worked hard with his hands. He wanted to remove every stumbling block, any stumbling block that would come between him and the Corinthian church, anything that would stop them from receiving the gospel. That's why he didn't charge any money. Because he knew that these false super apostles, they were charging money. So this would be definitely a line drawn in the sand between them and him. He wanted to demonstrate his unconditional love by refusing to take anything. But he loved them and he deeply cared for their souls. Look at verse 8. He says, I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you, And was in need, I did not burden anyone, for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I I refrained, and I will refrain from burdening you in any way, as the truth of Christ is in me. This boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. Now again, Paul's heart is broken. They turned on him. And again, he's being cynical right here. Now, did he actually rob other churches in order to be able to minister in Corinth? Well, if you go back to Macedonia, if you remember Macedonia, they were poor. They were extremely poor. And yet, they had such a heart for Paul's ministry, such a heart for truth. They still, out of their their poorness, they gave to Paul to such a degree that Paul literally looks at it and says, it was like I was robbing them. But they did it out of a willing heart because they loved him so much. They loved the gospel and Jesus so much. Paul felt like he was doing a disservice to the Macedonians, but again, he was very grateful for all that they had done for his ministry. And he accepted it because he knew how much they loved him. But he did not accept anything from the Corinthian church, which was actually a wealthy church. Why? Look at verse 11. And why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. Why didn't he take money? Because he wanted to make sure there was nothing that would get in the way for them understanding his love and Christ's love for them. You see, Paul refused to give up, the church was being attacked. And he loved it so much that he was willing to die for it, to go hungry. And he appeals right here to the highest order to show his love for them. He says, you may doubt my love, but God is my witness of how much I love you. My actions are proof of my words. Look at verse 12. And what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission they work on the same terms as we do in other words they're taking money we're not taking money i'm not taking any money from you i want you to know i want you to know without a doubt i am who i claim to be see by paul not charging for his ministry he shined a bright light on the greed of those false teachers He confronted and exposed them for what they really were. And it's hard for the Corinthian church to understand it is a model for how we are to deal with deceivers. If we see one of our brothers or sisters getting caught up with false teachers, or they start to believe unbiblical doctrine, or we notice that they are slowly drifting away from the fellowship, listen, it's not the pastor's sole responsibility to go after these people. Whose responsibility is it? It's all of us. We all have the responsibility to love one another to such a degree that we call them and say, hey, I haven't seen you in two weeks. I haven't seen you in three weeks. What's going on? I don't want you to drift off. I love you. Come back. Come back to the fold. Listen, we need to love our fellow brothers and sisters enough to confront. You see, to stay loyal in the days of deception, I must stay connected to Christ's church. 
I must stay connected to Christ's church. Now, every Sunday we gather, and we gather because we are prayerfully growing in knowledge of who our God is. We're growing in theology and biblical doctrine. But just as importantly, we gather every single Sunday when we come through these doors. It's so we can pray for one another. It's so that we could build each other up. It's when, these, when church is dismissed here at 1130 that we go there into the lobby and we're, we're in each other's lives and we're, we're real with one another. That's what the church is. It's a place, it's a triage center where we're able to come alongside and build each other up to hold each other accountable to exhort, this is the place of the church. That's what's so beautiful about a small church is because it's a family and we should be active in each other's lives. That's what the church was meant to be, just as we're told in Hebrews chapter 10. He says, and let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The writer of Hebrews says it very clearly. He says, you know what? It's going to get darker and darker. The world's going to get filled with a lot of hatred. Good will be viewed as evil. Evil will be viewed as good. And the church needs to stand as the bedrock. And you better be encouraging and lifting each other up and holding each other accountable. Because there's going to be many who are going to want to drift. And we need to hold them tight. We need to keep everybody grounded together. That's the purpose of the church, to love each other. Look at verse 13. Paul tells us why. He says, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond with their deeds. Now, who does Paul say that these false teachers belong to? Not God. They are Satan's servants. Just as the devil masquerades as an angel of light, his demonic teachers, they allure those who are weak into believing heresy, untruths. And Paul says that their end will correspond with their deeds. Understand, God is not mocked. And that's exactly what we see in the end of the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 21. We are told the one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death beloved understand as our world continues to get darker and darker truth is going to continue to get more and more distorted and if you are not walking closely in line and in close fellowship with christ you are putting in your you're putting yourself in a position to easily be led astray Understand, I think that we're living in days of an even greater deception than what Corinth experienced by far. I think we're pretty good. We do a pretty good job of spotting false doctrine in the church, I think especially in our church. I think if somebody was to come in and you're having a conversation with a new, just say uh, it's just a visitor that comes through the door and as they come through the door, they start telling you about what they believe. I think most of us in this room can go, ding, 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 ding. Okay, that right there, that's a false doctrine. What he's saying right there, that is not scriptural. I think that we could all do a pretty, just knowing my, knowing my church family, I think we could do a pretty good job of that. But my question is this, how good are we at identifying the tactics of the enemy throughout the week outside of the church? I ask you, How many of us invite Satan's emissaries into our homes on a daily basis? Sometimes we allow him to sit on the couch with us for hours on end, filling our heads with images as he whispers in our ears, filling our minds with half-truths. 
understand, Satan doesn't come to us dressed in a red suit with a pointy tail and, and, and pointy ears. That's not how he enters our life. You have to understand, his tactics are subtle. They appear innocent. They are non-threatening at face value. But he slowly begins to take hold of our minds to alter our thoughts. Most of the time, we're not even aware that it's happening again. And it slowly takes shape there before we can even, before we know we're not able to discern between truth and error. How does he do it? One minute at a time. One minute at a time. Again, from the social media we're putting into our, into our minds every single day. The worldly self-serving dogma that we allow to fill our minds. The stories that we, we read. Understand, Hollywood has an agenda. And if you notice almost every single show that you will watch now, what is in those shows? There's a homosexual character. This is intentional. They have to desensitize you and make it the normal. You are being programmed every single day, and you may not even think that it's happening, from the news that you watch to the programs that you flip through on your, on your phone, you are being programmed, indoctrinated. And you need to understand, where you spend your time is what you are going to become. Say, oh, no, Pastor, that's not, oh, yeah. You could deny it all you want. Where you spend your time is what you are going to become. I want you to take a moment and think about this. Again, I did a little research this week. How much time do you think the average person spends on their phone every day? Well, it's four hours and 32 minutes, but for the sake of doing easy math, I just made it four hours. Is that not staggering? Four hours a day, you are being indoctrinated. Four hours a day. How many hours is that in a week? 28 hours in a week? How many hours is that in a year? That's a lot of hours. You are being programmed. I am being programmed. What is right? What is wrong? What is true? What is not true? How I should view the world, how I should view politics, how I should view church, how I should view Jesus Christ, how I should view abortion, how I should view, I should view immigration, whatever it may be, you are being programmed how to think. Think about that. If you go down this road for 20 years, we'll just say you're already five years into it, so 15 more years, you will have wasted 29,120 hours of your life. Process that. 29,120 hours. You know how many years that is? Out of 20 years, you will have wasted three and a half years of your life Three and a half years, full 24-hour periods, three and a half years. For what? For what? 1,213 days you will never get back. I was talking to Sarah about this. What if you knew you only had three and a half more years to live? Can you imagine just saying, I'm going to use that last three and a half years just to sit on my phone in my chair and never move for three and a half years until I die? But essentially, that's what we're saying. But on the positive, what if you use that three and a half years to honor Christ? What if you use that three and a half years to get in his word and to draw in that close fellowship God says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Reading the word, 
stutter, studying the deeper theology, learning how awesome he is. Beloved, how different would your relationship be with him right now if you spent four hours a day with him? Would it not be amazing? Nonstop. How much stronger would your faith be? Even when you see the world crumbling around you, you could just say, Amen. My God reigns. We need to remember Paul's words from chapter 10. He says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take what? Every thought captive. Every thought captive. We must be a discerning people. We must know when the enemy is working in our lives and trying to divide us from our first love. We must have a heart that is discerning to be able to say, not on my watch, Lord Jesus. You have my heart. You are my life. Beloved, what are you being conformed by? The wisdom of God or the wisdom of this age? I'll tell you what, we would do well to take inventory of our lives, to do some good introspection as to what we have allowed to control and shape us. What do you fill your mind with? I think of the Puritans and their love for Christ. And, and I read their books, and they are just so mind-blowing of what they knew and what they were able to just describe just through the ministry and, and their love of doctrine and theology. And, you know, you read Owen, it's just it's staggering, this man's just conception of God. Why was that? It's because he didn't have a phone to spend four hours on, but he had a Bible to spend four hours in. And he loved it. And you could see it through his writings. Beloved, maybe you've been led astray from a sincere devotion to Christ. Maybe you're on the path right now to spiritual adultery and you haven't even realized it. And if you are, return to your first love. One word, repent. Recognize how far you have fallen and repent. Return to your love. Return to your first love. Take back your mind from the power of the enemy. Have a discerning spirit. Beloved, how do we keep from being deceived? We take every thought captive. Every thought. I'm not saying this is easy. It takes work. It takes focus. It takes a heart that says, Lord, not today. I'm not going there. I want to be with you. To stay loyal in the days of deception, I must have a discerning heart. I must have a sincere devotion to Christ. I must have a firm grasp of truth. And I must stay connected to Christ church. And if we do these things, we will stay in that intimate fellowship with our Lord. We will walk with him every day. We will keep from being seduced from the lies of the enemy. And that's my prayer for all of us, amen. Let's walk closely with him. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you so much for Paul and, and his example that he has given us, his love for the church, his love for your word. Oh, Lord, give us that discerning spirit to be able to see the lies of the enemy, to be able to see Satan when he comes to us as an angel of light and to cast it out of our lives quickly and to run to you, the author and perfecter of our salvation, that we live every day in close fellowship and intimacy with you, Lord Jesus. And I pray for all of us here this morning that this could be a reality in our lives, that we live for an audience of one, that we live every day wanting to know you more, to serve you, to honor you in Christ alone. Every day, Lord, just praising you and thanking you, living through the power of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, Lord, for all that you have done for us. You have given us the victory. We are more than conquerors through you who loved us. You have given us the power, the same power that rose Jesus Christ from the grave lives in us. We lack nothing. 
I pray through your power we live out these truths again daily, hourly, minute by minute in all that we do. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, please stand. alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still striving sees my comforter my all in all here in the love of Christ I stand in Christ alone who took on flesh fullness of God in helpless babe this gift of love Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live come forward. Let's pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this day. Thank you for bringing us together, Lord. Um, thank you for this church family. And right now, Father, I pray for the offering, pray for the many blessings that you've given us, and Father, we just give a little bit back to you to remind us, Lord, that uh, you are in control and that we are that everything that we have is yours, Lord. And I just pray that you can bless the offering, that it can be used for your purpose and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Gospel on which I 
Father, we thank you for giving us this time, Lord, and I just pray that as we go about our, our day and our week, that we would keep you in the center of our focus, Lord, that we would draw close to you, that we would spend time with you, Lord, um, that we would build our relationship with you, and it's not because of anything that we've done, Lord, but it's only through your strength, and it's only in you that we can live and have our being, and Lord, I just pray a blessing on this church, pray that we can um, have a good week, and that we can keep you in focus. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.